This video includes spoilers for the recent Genshin Impact version 1.4 questline. We will be reunited. If you have not yet finished that quest, you may want to click away for now and return after its completion. You have been warned. With the release of the We Will Be Reunited questline in Genshin Impact 1.4, we were hit with an all-out assault of story progression as the game dropped several major story advancements. Gone are the days in which our chosen protagonist isn't sure if their sibling still lives or not. Aether and Lumine were reunited. Beyond that, we received details which confirmed Lumine and Aether's presence 500 years ago, as I predicted back in September. But that isn't the focus of this theory. I believe what we learned from Dainsliff during this questline provided valuable insight to get into the mind space of both the Saritza and the Electro Archon Bao, allowing me to shed some light on what likely serves as the motivations for their actions, and what exactly it is that they are trying to do. Upon his arrival, Dainsliff shares many details of Tavat's past compared to that of his appearance during version 1.3. Among the first details Danes revealed was Conria was a nation which never had a god at all. This can easily connect Conria with the scribe's box in Dragonspine, which mentioned a land without gods existed as far back as the fall of Salvin Dagnir, confirming the ancient civilization existed for several thousand years, at least. Described by Danes as a once unprecedented, flourishing, and glorious civilization, the pride of humankind. He confirms that the calamity of 500 years ago was indeed the destruction of Conria. But not only this, Aether reveals that he already knew this as well, which explains the vision that he had of the destruction during the 1.3 questline, meaning the destructive conflict they arrived during was the destruction of the ancient and technologically advanced human society but why is it that confirmation is important? Dainsliff explained that the gods of Tevat were the harbingers of that time who brought destruction upon Conria. Curiously, he used the word gods in a plural form specifically when describing their descent into Tevat prior to the desolation they brought to Conria and did not mention anything about the celestial throne or those who may pull the strings of the seven themselves. Danes seem to place the blame for this travesty upon the seven archons of the lands, as if they were the ones who committed the act of destruction personally, but without saying it directly. If this was the case, what incited the rage of the celestial overseers? Was it simply because they were a nation without a god that brought ruin upon them? Paimon specifically tells us that Tevat's history books have no mention of the god's destruction of Conria. But history is told by the victors, and Celestia, it seems, is content to bury the past. But not all Archons may be so anxious, however, to bury that past. One is acting curiously against the intent of Celestia, the Saritza. With her harbinger, she is working to claim the Gnosis from each of the seven, for still unknown reasons. But what if the reason she's taking the Gnosis from other Archons is because they serve not just as a badge of office and a tool which allows them to grant visions to those who dwell in Tevat, but also, what if they serve as a controlling factor for Celestia, allowing the Archons to be bent to their will? At their beck and call, they are compelled against their will to smite those who dare challenge the rule of Celestia. Conria had begun to develop not just technology which would eliminate their need to be ruled and protected by the Archons, but also the mystical art of Chemia grants nearly godlike powers to those who learn its secrets. Conria may have been perceived as a direct threat to the rest of Tavat, since there were those in Conrian culture who believed that the land is not to be tilled with farming tools, but rather is to be fought for with steel and blood, a sentiment that gave birth to what they called field tillers, but today they are the ruin guards. 
This would suggest that Conria may have been a conquering or warlike society at its core. As this culture continued to grow, the eyes of Celestia became fixed on them, until the alchemist Gold, driven mad by her alchemical powers and greed, began to create dark and tragic creatures like Durin in the attempt to claim the throne in the heavens. This, I believe, is the mortal irrigation the sustainer of heavenly principles referenced before imprisoning Aether and Lumine. And I believe it was this that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Chemia was a gateway to powers that one could use to rival the gods, and would need to be erased to ensure Teyvat remains not at peace, but rather under the predictable control of Celestia. With their chosen seven Archons activated, they turned against the humans of Conria and used their powers to annihilate them. But what is it that suggests to me that the Gnosis could be used by the Celestial Overseers in such a way? It's a culmination of little subtle hints, I believe, that are weaving this tale. We have seven Archons, with seven Gnosis, and each is modeled after a chess piece. The two we've seen being the Animo and Geonosis, representing the Queen and Rook, respectively. We don't know what role on the board the other Archons will play yet, but the important thing to note is there are nine distinctly different chess pieces, eight of which reside in the back row in the game of chess. Two Rooks, two Knights, and two Bishops flank the Queen and King, but we have seven Archons who then holds the eighth Gnosis, the King's Gnosis upon which may be granted the power to command all others. Much like the One Ring in the works of Tolkien, this King's Gnosis could possibly allow its wielder to compel the owners of the other Gnosis against their will to enact any command that is issued. And I believe it is here that we begin to uncover the motivations of the Tsaritsa. 500 years ago, she was used as an unwilling participant in the destruction of Conria. After the smoke cleared and the dust had settled, she and the Archons regained their consciousness. Save for one, the Dendro Archon, who lied defeated somewhere amongst the ruin of the once great nation of humanity. How this Archon was killed, we don't really know. But we do know that it coincides with the events of 500 years ago. But perhaps it was not the surviving Archons, but the Dendro Archon who was fortunate, as the survivors remained to grapple with what had been done. They had just been used as an army, not just to smite humanity, and not even just those of reckless or greedy intent, but the innocent as well. The Archons had aided in the transformation of these innocents into abyssal creatures. Today, they are hilly churl and abyss mages, a significantly less potent threat than the once flourishing and advanced society of 500 years past. We know Barbados was involved in the war against Conria, as the suffering of those in Mondstadt under siege by the Black Dragon Durin brought him forth from his slumber, after which he summoned Dvalin to combat the Dark Beast. Recorded history documented Barbados's last descent into Mondstadt as the events resulting in the rebellion against the aristocracy 1,000 years ago. However, as I mentioned, history is told by the victors, and Celestia ensured that Venti's role 500 years ago went forgotten as did the sacrifice of the dragon Dvalin, paving the way for the people to forget his heroic role in Durin's defeat. As we learned recently, Danes is a surviving royal guard of Conria. He is a living history book cursed with immortality, which cannot be erased or controlled so easily. During Venti's collected miscellany, Danes confirms for us it has been half as long as history would have us believe. Venti was present during the destruction of this once proud culture, 
Fenty also told us this himself. After the events of 500 years ago, the Tsaritsa broke off all ties with him. But I believe her reasoning for this was not personal. She was not closing herself off to the God of Wind, but instead, she was closing off everyone. Her subjects, her fellow Archons, and especially Celestia. Once known as the God of Love, the Tsaritsa could not reconcile her recent actions. Unable to save the innocents which dwelled in Conria, and unable to prevent the death of the Dendro Archon, such injustice with the love she has for all living things was torment. Because of this, she hardened her heart to ensure that she and the other Archons could never be used in this fashion again. The Tsaritsa began to build her own army, forge technology, and grant artificial visions known as delusions, which do not originate from the powers of the Gnosis. But you may ask then, if she is able to grant visions to her subjects, why bother with the artificial powers which carry with them the ability to backfire and kill its wielder, as was the case for Deluc's father? For this, we have to explore the one remaining piece on the chessboard, the pawn. Those who are versed in the rules of the game of chess will know that the effects of reaching the opposite side of the board with the pawn results in that pawn ascending to the role of any other piece that is currently missing from the board, with the exception of the king. With the recent death of the Dendro Archon on her mind, and knowing that they would soon be replaced by one of Tevat's Dendro-wielding allogenes, she realized the allogenes are the key. They are the pawns able to replace the Archons, and if she could just prevent their creation, then there would be none to replace the Archons if they were lost. Desiring to create a powerful organization of enforcers to enact her will, but unwilling to create more allogenes herself, she created the Delusion, granting those who wield them the power of the elements without the added hidden role of allogene. The allogenes are the ninth piece on the chessboard. They are the pawns. They are gifted a vision for the express purpose that with it, they can ascend to the heavens and become an Archon, in effect, reaching the other side of the chessboard and replacing a lost Archon after receiving their Gnosis. With this factor controlled, the Tsaritsa would need only prevent the other Archons from being manipulated by Celestia and creating additional allogenes. Thusly, she dispatched her eleven Fatui Harbingers in order to collect the Gnosis from the other Archons. This would possibly explain why Zhang Li would willingly hand over his Gnosis, as he isn't exactly pleased with his former conduct during the Archon War, feeling he was at times too heavy-handed, much less continuing to have the potential to be used as a weapon of war. However, knowing the risks of leaving Liyue unprotected, he continued to hold his Gnosis in order to protect his people until he was no longer needed. Venti, in a similar way, would continue to also hold on to his Gnosis, fully understanding the risk, but also knowing that every so often, he would be needed to nudge the people of Mondstadt back into peaceful order. Of the remaining Archons, we don't know much, except that the Electro Archon, Bal, for the last year, has begun to reclaim all visions within the borders of Inazuma, likely because her Gnosis was taken from her unwillingly by the Harbingers. Perhaps, even by Skatermush, the sixth of the eleven Fatui Harbingers, who is known to be from Inazuma, and is now a vagrant after his enlistment by the Tsaritsa and subsequent probable betrayal to Bal. With her Gnosis gone and feeling exposed, she's begun to reclaim all visions for fear the existing allogenes may replace her. Reclaiming the Electro Visions thus reduces her potential for replacement. And, by reclaiming the other non-Electro Visions on top of this, may be her way of forging a weapon she feels will be capable of defending her nation from whatever is to come next. Seven Ideals for Seven Gods and of these, eternity is nearest unto heaven. Zhang Li quoted Bao as saying this frequently, 
a window into her mindset, establishing her as a god who thinks highly of her role as the god of eternity. To prevent her people from learning the truth that she no longer holds her noses, Baal today lies to her people, telling them that the visions are divine blessings of which they are not worthy, and summarily reclaims them. A motivating factor that is reinforced by her staunch belief that her role should be an everlasting one, and is greater than that of the other Archons. But in reality, she simply knows she's in a weakened state, and out of fear, she's doing all she can to prevent being replaced. As a final note, with all of the Gnosis in hand, I believe that the Saritza's endgame is to remove the seven Archons from the fight, so that her army has a better chance at effectively toppling the heavens, allowing her to usher in a new era of peace and safety for Tevat. This idealistic nature of doing the wrong thing for a noble goal of releasing the world from an unknown and tyrannical power is likely why Tartaglia supports her without question. After all, similar motivations define his own personality. The Saritza's final plan is likely to then claim and destroy the king's gnosis, breaking the cycle of allergens and gnosis, ensuring the Archons can never be used as a weapon to commit culture-ending atrocities again. Do you believe that the Saritza's goal is actually a noble one? Do you believe that the Vision Hunt decree in Inazuma was enacted by the Electro Archon to prevent her subjects from learning the truth of her missing gnosis? Be sure to let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like, subscribe, and don't forget to hit the bell icon so that you are notified when my next video goes live. Lastly, join the Tevat Historia Discord server to discuss Genshin Impact's lore, mechanics, or even discuss your theories with the community members. Thanks for watching Tevat Historia. May the seven guide you, travelers.